Between 1932 and 1942, five major French ocean liners were destroyed by fire. From the all but forgotten Georges Philippa to the beloved Normandy, all of these ships were lavish, modern vessels equipped with the latest safety features of the time. But they were all destroyed. Was it bad luck or carelessness? Design flaws or sabotage? Here are the stories of five French ocean liners lost to the decade of fire. Launched on November 6, 1930 for the French shipping company Messagerie Maritime, the MS George Philippar was a bold step forward in ship design. While she couldn't compete with the liners serving the premier transatlantic routes, she was significantly more comfortable, fast, and technologically advanced than most other ships sailing between France and the Far East. Built in Saint-Nazaire, she was designed to carry passengers between Marseille and ports in China, Japan, Shanghai, and what was then British Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Coming in at 17,359 tons, the new liner implemented several innovative designs. She was powered by two 10-cylinder marine diesel engines that drove twin screws, which could achieve a service speed of 18.5 knots. She measured 542.7 feet, or 165.4 meters in length, with a 68.2 foot, or 20.8 meter beam. Painted a brilliant white, she sported a modern angular superstructure with unique squat funnels that her crew called flower pots. Electric power was used extensively throughout the ship, powering everything from deck winches to kitchen appliances and heating and passenger spaces. Her first class interiors were lavishly decorated with extensive varnished wood paneling throughout. Her maiden voyage left Marseille on February 26, 1932, bound for Yokohama, Japan via the Suez Canal. Her debut coincided with a period of simmering political unrest in France. Before her maiden voyage began, French police received a series of threats targeting the new liner. But these threats were disregarded, and the Philippa arrived safely in Yokohama, successfully completing the first leg of the voyage without any major incident. Not long after she began her maiden voyage on May 7, 1932, Paul de Met, the president of France, was assassinated. Three days later, on May 10, the Georges Philippar left Colombo and sailed for the Red Sea, carrying approximately 518 passengers and 347 crew. Not long after midnight, around 145 nautical miles off the Horn of Africa, a first-class passenger awoke to a burning smell in her cabin on D-deck. She soon discovered a small fire burning behind the light switch. The fire spread quickly, igniting the room's heavily varnished wood paneling. The ship's crew was alerted and soon Captain Vic was summoned. By the time he arrived, the fire had spread throughout the first-class D-deck spaces, trapping most of these passengers in their cabins. Electricity to that part of the ship cut off, and crews desperately tried to beat back the flames, but nothing seemed to work. Many of her portholes were left open that night due to the hot weather, and a steady breeze further fanned the flames. Thick fumes and smoke filled the ship as confusion and panic set in. As efforts to contain the blaze failed, Captain Vic ordered the ship abandoned and an SOS sent out. But by the time he gave the order, the fire had already spread to the ship's wireless cabin. The fire had also already overtaken several lifeboats, rendering them inoperable. Just as the situation seemed hopeless, the lights of two ships appeared on the horizon. A Soviet tanker, the Soviet Skya Neft, and a British cargo ship in the Sud spotted the glowing flames consuming the passenger ship and raced to the scene. The two ships put out a distress call, and soon other vessels arrived to aid in the rescue. 420 people were rescued by the Soviet tanker. 149 by the British cargo ship, and another 129 were taken aboard another cargo ship called the Contractor. A Japanese ocean liner, SS Hakana Maru, also aided in the rescue efforts. 
By 8.35 that morning, Captain Vic was the only person left aboard the burning liner. When he was absolutely sure that every other survivor escaped, he left the burning ship. The fire raged for another three days. Finally, on May 19, 1932, the burned-out shell of the Georges Philippard sank in the Gulf of Aden. Fifty-four people lost their lives in the tragedy, mostly passengers in D-deck cabins who were trapped by the rapidly spreading inferno. Had the tragedy struck in more remote waters and not in one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world, the death toll likely would have been significantly higher. An investigation was launched and arson was immediately thought to be the cause of the blaze. Speculation ran wild. One of the victims of the fire was a high-profile political journalist, Albert Landre, who was returning home after reporting on an assignment in China. It was suggested that the blaze was set by those angered by his reporting. But it was soon realized that the cause of the blaze was much more mundane. Even before the Georges Philippot left the shipyards in Saint-Nazaire, it was clear that her direct current electrical system was faulty. Numerous shorts and power surges nearly prompted her builders to delay her delivery, but any delay would have caused costly overages and it was ultimately decided that these issues could be worked out after she entered service. Before the tragedy, at least two small fires had already broken out on the ship, though both were quickly contained. So many heating elements shorted out that new ones had to be ordered when the ship was docked in Yokohama. It was ultimately determined that an improperly installed wire in the first class cabin's light switch sparked and ignited the wood paneling. The ship's wood panels were coated in a shiny new varnish that proved to be highly flammable. Once the flames took hold, there was absolutely nothing that the crew could do to stop them. Several safety recommendations came out of the Georges Philippard tragedy, including limiting the use of wood paneling on ships but the Georges Philippard would be far from the last French ocean liner lost to fire. following World War I, German shipping rebounded faster than anyone expected. Unnerved by their rivals' dominance over European trade with South America, in April 1928 the French government agreed to provide the necessary funds to build two new liners for the failing Compagnie de Navigation Sud-Atlantique. On November 28, 1928, the first of these new liners was laid down at the shipyards in San Jose. This new vessel was built to rival even the greatest liners serving the premier transatlantic routes. Launched on April 15, 1930, SS L'Atlantique came in at an impressive 42,512 tons and measured 713.6 feet or 217.5 meters in length with a beam of 92 feet or 28 meters. She was equipped with four steam turbines that drove four screws to achieve a speed of 21 knots. L'Atlantique was an art deco masterpiece. Her size allowed her designers, which included the pioneer of the art deco movement, Pierre Pateau, a canvas with which to create grand sweeping interiors accentuated by simple yet dramatic glass, metal, marble, and fine wood finishes. She sailed her maiden voyage on September 29, 1931. While she was celebrated for her size, style, and power, Lazalente quickly proved a disappointment as passenger numbers never quite met expectations. The luxury liner made her debut at the height of the Great Depression. Her sumptuous interiors proved too much for a dwindling traveling public that newly sought austerity over excess. But there is hope that in time, demand would rebound and the Grand Liner would soon begin recouping her building costs. Unfortunately, this chance never came. On January 3, 1933, L'Atlantique left for a refit in Le Havre. Under the command of Captain Schuss, she was operated by just a skeleton crew of 229. Almost immediately, the liner encountered rough weather as she entered the English Channel. Without passengers or cargo, she was running light in the water, causing her to roll even more dramatically in the heavy seas. 
By that evening, even her engine room staff was finding it difficult to move around the ship. At around 4.30 on the morning of January 4th, a seaman was making his rounds on E-deck when he noticed the faint smell of smoke. The smell led him to cabin E-232 where he discovered a small fire. He quickly raised the alarm and alerted the bridge. Captain Schoefs was awoken and he headed to E-deck to assess the situation himself. When the elevator doors opened, he was confronted by a wall of wafting thick black smoke that already filled the corridor. Crews donned face masks and began a desperate fight to contain the rapidly spreading blaze. The thick smoke made their task all but impossible. To disperse some of the smoke, Captain Schoef ordered all the doors and portholes in the area open. The flood of oxygen massively intensified the blaze. Soon fires were popping up all over the ship's first-class public rooms and cabins. Still trapped in the storm, the ship's heavy rolling made fighting the inferno all the more difficult. Captain Schoef had the liner turned in an attempt to calm the violent rolling and ordered all crews to assist in fighting the fire. Spiraling out of control, crews found themselves overtaken by the hellish inferno as the heavily varnished wood panels all around them seemed to spontaneously burst into flames ignited by the intense heat. The inferno burned so intensely that her hull and deck plates soon began to buckle and warp. As gallons of seawater were pumped in to fight the blaze, the already lightened ship soon took on a 15 degree list. By now several vessels in the area had responded to the distress calls and were racing to the scene. As dawn filled the bridge with daylight, Captain Schoof realized that saving his ship was hopeless. His responsibilities turned now to saving his crew. At 7.45 he ordered an abandoned ship. Strong winds in the now considerable 20 degree list made it impossible to lower her port lifeboats, but her starboard boats were hastily prepared. Down below in her engine rooms, crews attempted to shut down her boilers to reduce the risk of an explosion, but the smoke was too dense to reach her forward boiler room. Engineering officer DeJoy was forced to shut off ventilation to these forward rooms and sent a message to the men still working in them, ordering them to evacuate. He then assembled the remaining engineering officers and crew, and together they navigated the perilous smoke-filled passageways up to the deck. In the chaos, three men were separated from the group. They were only found long after the disaster. All three had died from smoke inhalation. DeJoy and his men gathered at their muster station at lifeboat 15. They boarded and DeJoy started the winch to lower the lifeboat, but soon fire spread all around him, forcing him away from the winch. He had no choice but to leap out and climb down the lines to the half-lowered boat as flames burst out all around them. Soon the fire burned through the cables, spilling the men into the churning sea 30 feet below. With little other choice, men began jumping into the sea, but fortunately they were soon picked up by lifeboats from the surrounding rescue ships. Soon only a small group of men were left on board, trapped on the forecastle, one of the only areas not yet engulfed by flames. These men included Captain Schoves and First Officer Gaston. After the Dutch cargo ship Achilles was assured that there was almost no risk of an explosion, they got as close as they could to the liner and sent lifeboats to rescue the remaining men. Captain Schoves was the last to leave as the hulk of the once mighty luxury liner smoldered in the morning light. The abandoned ship burned for four more days and soon came to rest approximately three nautical miles from the Isle of Portland on the English Channel. Five men were lost in the fire, only to be discovered days later. Just two of their bodies were identifiable. Her burned out hull was towed to Cherbourg, and despite some disagreement over whether salvage was possible, she was eventually deemed a total loss and scrapped in Glasgow three years later. The insurance settlement was used to finance the construction of the relatively smaller SS Pasteur a less remarkable liner that nevertheless enjoyed a relatively successful nearly 40-year career. Few liners before or since could match the beauty of L'Atlantique's interiors. Her finery was her lasting legacy and her downfall. The success of the French line's new Ile de France and the company's prosperity by the end of the 1920s prompted a major investment in new vessels to replace aging intermediate liners. 
This new round of building offered considerable opportunity to innovate and the French were eager to invest in the latest technology and design. On May 9th, 1929, the company launched the MV Lafayette, seizing on the burgeoning trend of diesel-powered motor vessels. The modestly sized Lafayette could carry 1,081 passengers. She came in at 23,666 gross registered tons and measured 603.7 feet or 184 meters in length, with a beam of 77.4 feet or 23.6 meters. She was powered by four diesel engines, making her the largest French motor ship and the first to serve the New York route. Her interiors mirror the Art Deco style of other French liners from the time, and were designed by the same team that recently completed the Ile de France. Comfort was a top priority and numerous cabins were outfitted with private bathrooms and hot and cold running water, and individual thermostats allowed passengers to control the heat in their cabins. The Lafayette entered service on May 17, 1930, and she enjoyed a relatively successful career. On August 31, 1936, she collided with an English cargo ship called the Ben Maple, only 25 miles from where the Empress of Ireland sank on the St. Lawrence River estuary. While the damage to the Lafayette was so minimal that most passengers didn't even realize anything had happened, the impact killed a crew member on the Ben Maple and quickly sank the small ship. Her survivors were soon picked up by the Lafayette, and the limited damage was soon repaired. In a way, the tragedy that ended the Lafayette's career was far less dramatic. On the evening of May 4th, 1938, during an overhaul in La Havre, an oil spill in her boiler room ignited. The blaze soon spread to her fuel tanks and quickly raged out of control. Crews tried to fight the inferno, but they were quickly overwhelmed and shore-based firefighters had to be called in to help contain the blaze. The ship's electric panels were soon destroyed, cutting off lights and making it all the more difficult to coordinate. Soon the fire spread to the ship's lavish passenger spaces. Her wood paneling and furniture further fueled the inferno and by 11pm a massive column of flames could be seen shooting out of the top of the ship near her funnel. The situation became too dangerous for anyone to remain on board and crews were ordered to evacuate at around midnight. As they raced down her gangplanks, a series of explosions began going off all over the ship as the intense heat ripped her apart from the depths of her engine room. The fire continued to burn for another two days. When the wreck could finally be inspected, the charred remains of an unidentified crew member were discovered. The Lafayette was deemed a total loss. On June 10, 1938, her remains were towed to Rotterdam, where they were scrapped. Now almost completely forgotten, the Lafayette disaster ominously foreshadowed what was to come. After the turn of the century, as German and British shipping companies competed to build ever larger and faster liners, the French made a name for themselves through luxury and comfort. The aptly named SS France sailed her maiden voyage on April 20th, 1912, only a few days after the loss of the Titanic. She was only half the size of the Olympic and Imperator classes, but what she lacked in size, she made up for in service and splendor. She instantly earned renown for her lush Baroque interiors, fine cuisine, and chic onboard atmosphere. The success of SS France, dubbed the Versailles of the Atlantic, prompted the French line to commission a series of new liners. With financing provided by the French government, the keel of SS Paris was laid down in Saint Nazaire in 1913. Plans called for four new vessels, launched every five years, following the model set by SS France. Each new liner would be a unique work of art, larger and more splendid than the last. However, construction on SS Paris stopped when war broke out in Europe. Her nearly completed hull sat rusting on her slipway until she was finally launched without any fanfare on September 12, 1916, simply to clear space for wartime construction. The unfinished liner was towed to Quiberon Bay, where she sat for another three years. Work resumed in 1919 and lasted another two years. 
Viesse's Paris made her long-awaited debut on June 15, 1921. At 34,570 gross registered tons, she was the largest French liner to date. She measured 768 feet or 234 meters in length, with a beam of 85 feet or 26 meters. She could carry 3,241 passengers and operated with a crew of 657. She was powered by four Parsons steam turbines that could achieve a 23 knot service speed. Her grand interiors melded Art Nouveau and the burgeoning Art Deco design movement to create a truly unique and palatial atmosphere. While her delayed debut made her feel older than she was, the Paris easily picked up the tradition set by the France and became a popular and fashionable way to cross the Atlantic. The introduction of the revolutionary Ile de France galvanized the public's attention, and when the Normandy entered service in 1935, plans were made to begin operating the Paris exclusively on cruises to the Caribbean and Mediterranean, a growing industry that the Paris seemed well suited for. But at around 10 o'clock on the evening of April 18, 1939, while she was moored in Le Havre, a fire broke out in her bakery on A deck. In a few hours, cabins along her entire promenade deck were fully engulfed in flames. As the blaze intensified and fire crews began pouring water into the ship, crews were sent below to save several valuable art pieces from her cargo holds. But the ship soon grew unstable as gallons of water were pumped into her first class spaces. The liner's safety features worked against her as watertight doors, sealed to contain the blaze, kept the water high in the ship. In the early morning hours, fire crews were forced to evacuate, and at 9.15, the Paris rolled onto her starboard side and settled into the harbor mud. The accident took place only a few yards from a dry dock where the Normandy was undergoing maintenance. The capsized liner briefly trapped the flagship, but the Paris's masts and funnels were quickly cut away to clear the vital channel. Only a few months later, World War II broke out, and the wreck of the Paris, deemed a total loss, remained a navigational hazard in Le Havre throughout the war. In December 1946, the German liner Europa, which was recently handed over to the French as reparations for the lost Normandy, foreshadowing, broke free from her moorings in a storm and collided with the wrecked Paris. She quickly sank, but crews were able to refloat her and continue converting her into the Liberté. The SS Paris was not so lucky. Her burned out hull was finally scrapped on scene in 1947, putting an end to the once unique and glamorous French Lines flagship. The decade of fire culminated with the loss of the greatest liner ever built. I could talk all day about Normandy, but for this video, I'll keep it brief. In 1922, a Russian naval architect named Vladimir Yorkovich moved to Paris after fleeing the Bolshevik Revolution two years prior. After briefly working for Renault, he finally secured a job as a draftsman at the Pinot shipyard. During this time, he began working on a radical new hull design that would dramatically increase speed and efficiency. While the British passed when he presented the whole idea for their upcoming superliner, the French were much more open to innovation. Yorkovich was commissioned to begin developing his design into France's next great superliner. While the French were always content to leave size and speed to the Germans and British, nationalism was at an all-time high, fueling a new appetite for competition. The new liner wouldn't only be the most luxurious ship to ever sail, she would also be the largest and the fastest. Her hull, designated T6, was laid down in San Jose on January 26, 1931. She was launched on October 29, 1932. Over the next two years, an army of artists and craftsmen worked together to create a masterpiece. There was no other ship like the Normandy. Sometimes looking more like a fine art gallery than a ship, she featured some of the most luxuriously appointed public spaces ever created. I'll reserve a detailed walkthrough of her interiors for a later video, but suffice to say, her beauty was overwhelming. Normandy sailed her maiden voyage on May 29, 1935 to rave reviews. 
She easily seized the blue ribbon from Italy's wrecks and made headlines around the world. But her dominance wouldn't last long. With Great Britain's new Queen Mary, Normandy had a fitting rival to challenge her status as the Queen of the Atlantic. In many ways, the Queen Mary was better suited for the times. Her comfort, power, utility, and longevity endured her to the hearts of the world. Normandy, on the other hand, through freak misfortune, became the stuff of legends. By late summer 1939, with tensions building in Europe, the French sought to protect their flagship in the safety of New York Harbor, and she was docked at Pier 88. On the 3rd of September 1939, the day France declared war on Germany, she was interned by the U.S. government, though she remained in French hands and kept her French crew. She was soon joined by the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, and for five months, the three largest liners in the world sat idle while their home countries burned. On May 15, 1940, the United States Coast Guard issued 150 agents to protect the ship from sabotage as German troops overwhelmed France, which soon fell to Nazi Germany on June 25, 1940, shocking the world. Despite the fall of France, U.S. Coast Guard agents remained in a supervisory role on the Normandy until the United States was attacked at Pearl Harbor and officially drawn into the war. On December 12, 1941, the Normandy was officially seized under the right of Angry now that France was under Nazi control. Her French crews were relieved and the Coast Guard took over maintenance of the ship. They took up several key duties, including maintaining steam in her boilers, but they unfortunately abandoned maintaining her elaborate fire control systems. She was renamed the USS Lafayette on December 31, 1941. A few plans were considered for the massive liner. There was even a proposal to turn her into an aircraft carrier. But they of course moved forward with the most logical option, which was to convert her into a troop ship. She would be converted at Pier 88. The contract was awarded to the Robbins Dry Dock and Repair Company. A delay for her scheduled first sailing date was requested to give crews more time to plan and execute the complicated conversions, but these requests were ultimately denied. This gave crews less than two months to complete the project. It would have been one of the more impressive engineering feats of the war if they had managed to pull it off, but of course, they failed. Crews were completely unfamiliar with the complicated ship, and the unrealistic time frame created a chaotic and dangerous work environment. On the morning of February 9th, 1942, the feverish work of removing Normandy's luxurious fittings was well underway in her vast public rooms, which featured mechanical firewalls that could divide the spaces and contain fires in an emergency. These were, of course, disabled. And even if they were operational, they were blocked with piles of flammable materials, including thousands of life jackets that were filled with capic, a great material for flotation that also happened to be highly flammable. Crews were in the process of removing the four giant light fixtures from her lounge. These fixtures sat on metal tripods that had to be cut away with a torch. This cutting process used an asbestos shield to contain sparks, but as the crew made cuts on the final leg, the shield was prematurely removed and sparks ignited the piles of flammable life jackets all around them. Contrary to regulations, there were no fire extinguishers nearby, no fire hoses on hand, and no fire watcher. They just had two buckets of water. The fire spread quickly and crews broke into absolute chaos. A worker running to bring the two buckets of water tripped, spilling the water well short of the flames. Another worker ran to the promenade to fetch a fire hose, but they only got about a gallon of water from its nozzle before pressure dropped to nothing. Remember that whole disabling the fire control system thing? The New York City Fire Department responded to the call 12 minutes later. The first fireboat on the scene was the James Duane. By the time she arrived, the ship was completely overtaken with smoke, forcing all crews to evacuate. Her furnaces were shut down, leaving the ship without power to light her interiors or power any water pumps. There were around 3,000 men on board when the fire broke out, and the evacuation was complete chaos, with hundreds forced to make their way through the blacked-out, smoke-filled passageways of the ship many of them were completely unfamiliar with. Incredibly, only 200 were injured, and there was only one fatality. Frank Trentacosta, a 36-year-old Brooklyn resident who was part of the Fire Watch. The fire rattled New York, already on edge following the attacks on Pearl Harbor only two months prior. Without any other options and facing winds that helped spread the blaze throughout the ship, 
Crews simply pumped as much water as they could on the blaze, and the ship soon began listing dangerously to port. Vladimir Yorkovich, Normandy's designer, was actually in New York at the time, and he rushed to the scene to help. He knew the ship better than anyone, but he was barred from the scene by police. He urged them to open her seacocks and allow the ship to settle on an even keel in the shallow water, but he was ignored because this was a Navy job. Early the next morning, the ship capsized. The press was barred from the scene by the Navy, who knew the incompetence of the situation was not a good look. But the morning light revealed the extent of the damage. The former Normandy was a total loss, and the wreck would remain at Pier 88 for nearly two years until she was finally righted. Fitting the Normandy, the salvage operation was the largest and most complex of the time, costing an estimated $5 million. Her burned out hull was sold for scrap for just $161,680, an insane bargain for a hull that size and she was finally cut up in New Jersey between 1946 and 1948. To make up for the loss, the French were awarded the German liner Europa, which spent the war rusting away in Bremerhaven. The ocean liner era truly culminated with Normandy, and no ship will ever rival her greatness. She was powerful, graceful, and beautiful, everything one thinks about when they imagine the bygone splendor of ocean travel. Her time was short, but her impact was immeasurable. Her early downfall made her the stuff of fantasy, a beautiful world of opulence and tranquility, something that real life will never quite live up to. Thank you so much for watching. I'd like to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon and my channel members. Their support helps keep the channel going. Alright crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people. <laughs>